to our chair speakers and the wonderful audiences of ACNS webinar. Before we start today's proceedings, we are extremely happy to share the news that our president, Professor Yoko Kato, has been honored with the Lifetime Recognition Award at the ongoing American Association of Neurological Surgeons virtual conference in Orlando yesterday. We would like to extend our hearty congratulations to her as well as all the members of the ACNS who work tirelessly for the goal of spreading neurosurgical education for all. Coming back to our webinars, today we have two wonderful speakers and equally great chairs who are going to enlighten us in the next coming hours. The first speaker for today is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Takamitsu Fujimaki. Professor Fujimaki is the professor and chair, Department of Neurosurgery, Saitama Medical University, Japan, and has a joint appointment with the Department of Neuro-Oncology in International Medical Center, Saitama Medical University. He also serves as a director, International Education and Training Center of Saitama Medical University. He is serving as an active member for the executive boards in various societies, including the Japan Society of Microvascular Decompression Surgery or Japanese Society for Neuro-Oncology. He is a secretary general for the Office of Japan Society for MVD Surgery since 2018. As for his social activities, he is an executive board member of the Japan Brain Foundation and a board member for the relief system for sufferers from adverse drug reaction, Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare. He was awarded the Galinus Prize from the Japanese Neurosurgical Society in 94 and the Takeda Technology and Entrepreneurship Award from the Takeda Foundation in 2000. Two. He is a noted author with several publications in various peer review journals and we are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars and today he will be talking about how neurosurgeons should treat patients with facial pain and facial involuntary movements. The speaker for the second session of today is Professor Hiroyuki Toyama. Professor Toyama is the director of Shida Memorial Neurosurgery Clinic, Shizuoka, Japan. Professor Toyama reserves his, his interest in endovascular neurosurgery. He is a member of the Japan Neurosurgery Society and Japan Stroke Society and the Japan Society of Neuroendovascular Therapy. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars and he'll be talking about a topic which is very, very important for every aspiring hybrid surgeon, which is endovascular neurosurgery a beginner's guide for young neurosurgeons. The chair for the first session of today is our honored guest from India, Professor K.K. Turel. Professor Turel is a consultant neurosurgeon and chairman emeritus department of neurosurgery, Bombay Institute of Medical Sciences. He was the past president of Neurological Society of India, as well as the Asia Oceanic Skull Base Society. He is the chairman of the WFNS Committee on Complications in Neurosurgery. Professor Turel has received several awards and honors for his outstanding contribution towards neurosurgery. We are extremely honored to have him today to chair the session of Professor Fujimaki. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is a pioneer and a doyen in the field of endovascular neurosurgery from India, Professor Anil Karapurkar. Professor Karapurkar is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Bridge Candy Hospital, Mumbai. Professor Karapurkar was the past president of the Asia Australasian Federation of Interventional and Therapeutic Neuroradiology and the Cerebrovascular Society of India. He has authored several book chapters, published numerous articles in many reputed peer reviewed journals. We are extremely honored to have him today to chair the session of Professor Hiroyuki Toyama. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yoko Kata, I would like to welcome all the chairs, speakers, and the audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to the first chair, Professor K. Kiturel. Yes, thank you very much for this invitation. And we are extremely elated and delighted uh, to know that uh, uh, Professor Yoko Kato has been given this Lifetime Achievement Award, a much deserving award, which I think uh, she ought to have received much earlier. Uh, she's been extremely illustrious and uh, all of us know to introduce her would take away a, a lot of our time. So we know that she's an extremely, <clears throat> she's not only um, uh, a, a good neurosurgeon, but also a very, but also a very benevolent neurosurgeon who has taken the lead from her uh, earlier chairperson, Professor Kano, to uh, literally uh, help the all the Asian neurosurgeons uh, with her uh, with her generosity, with her teaching, and with distribution of books and instruments and uh, and the amount of charity and philanthropy that she has exhibited is unparalleled by any individual. And I would really tell. Uh, truly call her the Mother Teresa of neurosurgery. Uh, and uh, so uh, congratulations to Dr. Yoko. And of course, I know that she has not only encouraged a number of neurosurgeons in, in India and in Asia, but also in Japan. Uh, and the young Japanese neurosurgeons look upon her as a mother uh, who, and, and I see that 
multiple WFNS meetings where she carries along with him, she carries these young boys with them everywhere and introduces them to the world stage, which I think is a act of great patriotism towards Japan. Uh, the, topic, the topic I'm expected to uh, chair today is on uh, facial pain and facial involuntary movements, uh, as has been published. Now, both of them have been clubbed together to emphasize on the aspect of neurovascular conflict. These are two neurovascular conflict syndromes and trigeminal neuralgia and hemifacial spasm. When we talk about facial pain, facial pain itself is a very vast subject. And though most of the patients would be having trigeminal neuralgia, typical idiopathic as we call it, but there are also patients with atypical trigeminal pain. And then there are patients with a plethora of pain, painful conditions, uh, ranging from headache to sinusitis to glaucoma to all kinds of other pain syndromes. And therefore it's very important to distinguish trigeminal neuralgia from those kind of painful syndromes. Um, and so we know that typically trigeminal neuralgia is a electric shock like current like pain, which is spasmodic, which is temporary, which is excess, temporary remissions and exacerbations, uh, which doesn't last continuously, unlike other facial pains. So uh, it is a, uh, and it has always been restricted to the trigeminal nerve zones. So it could be the first, second or the third division. Quite often second and third division is the combination is more common. And um, there can be a trigger point. So these are the ways to distinguish trigeminal pain from, and I'm sure Dr. Uh, Fujimaki will be able to, uh, will, will talk more about it. But what I can only emphasize is the importance of diagnosing the correct thing, the correct point as to, because the treatment varies significantly one from the other. And classical trigeminal neuralgia is an extremely distressing pain. It is the worst pain mankind can suffer to the extent that it can drive somebody to suicide. And any patient, therefore, who is being treated for trigeminal must have an MRI done. MRI is important because it will distinguish the classical primary idiopathic pain of trigeminal from other kinds of pain of secondary etiology. That means the tumors or epidermoid or meningioma or acoustic neuroma, whatever. Also, it will distinguish the, uh, the, uh, the neurovascular conflict and the grade of conflict. And therefore, it might also suggest the kind of treatment that we need to give because there are varying methods of treatment, as you might know. If it is, and if it is negative for neurovascular conflict, then it may also guide in, in the presence of classical pain. It may guide you to perform some neuroability procedures, which are otherwise not chosen or not selected in a classical trigeminal algebra where the MRI is positive for vascular conflict. So it's very important to have, even if you're going to treat medically, it's very important to have at the outset a MRI diagnosis. And as we know that there are some very specific sequences of MRI which are useful to distinguish this kind of pain for, for grading it, for diagnosing the arterial compression and the venous compression. And all these things are now quite advanced. And one needs to have these sequences, which is called as a trigeminal protocol, in order to outline the final treatment. Of course, trigeminal neuralgia is always treated initially medically, but uh, carbamazepine or oxcobimazepine, and only when it is not amenable to medical treatment, then we should consider other options. And apart from microvascular decompression, which I think is the fundamentally the best method of, uh, of uh, cure, because it removes the cause of pain. It actually eliminates the cause of pain, unlike other procedures, which are meant to palliate, like ablative procedures like the RFTC or glycerol injection or balloon compression or gamma knife. These are all sort of ablative procedures because they result in numbness without removing the cause. So there's a completely different method of treatment. And whenever you see a vascular compression, then of course, MBD is a treatment of choice. It's a very good, very safe and an excellent operation with very good long-term cures. But when you see a master like uh, Fujimaki operating, you might think that is one of the easy operations. But I can tell you that it has a lot of little tricks and little points, and you can sometimes even create morbidity. I know that it will be unpardonable if somebody has mortality, unpardonable. But even morbidity is not acceptable. 
and i would like dr fujima ki also to talk a few words on what happens if there is recurrent pain and what are the treatments available for those who fail to benefit on long term basis with mbd then what is the next line of treatment for those failures so although mbd still remains uh, the best line of treatment i think i have made my introduction uh, fairly uh, concise but fairly elaborate also at the same time and uh, i would like to learn a few more things from uh, professor fujimaki thank you very much thank you professor l um i i don't think i need to say anything more after your <laughs> <laughs> whole covering uh, introduction. So, and um, actually, I have may maybe um, ten times more slides regarding trigeminal and neuralgia. However, because it's forty minutes limit, and I need to talk both trigeminal and hemifacial, I cut many of them. So, I I'm I'm sorry because I didn't cover the abrasive procedures today, and also reoperation is very important. However, the operation cases, I'm not really shown here, but I, I, because of your introduction, I will a little bit mention about that. Today, I'm gonna to talking about the facial pain and facial involuntary movement. And actually, this is a great honor that I have a moderator, Professor Trell. Uh, we have been a nice friends for a long time. And I have now this, nothing to disclose today. So. Uh, this is Japan and expand here. This is Tokyo and this is Saitama. So you might acknowledge where I am. And this is our university. It's close to the mountainside, but also it's close to Tokyo. So facial pain, because uh, everybody knows trigeminal neurology is saved by the so-called microvascular decompression. We will talk about that. But before going to that, I have to say these two things. One, facial pain does not mean trigeminal neuralgia. That Professor Trell mentioned about a lot uh, in his introductory talk. And microvascular decompression is not the uh, only treatment for choice for the trigeminal neuralgia. This is also important, I think. And actually, if, if you look at the up-to-date, there are so many things are written here, and like uh, neurology and painful something, trigeminal neurology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Other causes, facial pain feature, what the trail mentioned about many things, and I don't think these are enough. There are so many other things uh, which we have to bone in our mind. And um, even trigeminal neurology, um, in the it's a JAMA uh, patient letter on um, six seven years ago. Uh, it says the starters think that trigeminal neurology is co caused by the pressure of the uh, vessel of trigeminal root. Oh, <laughs> they 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 say think we know it is, but. To some extent, this is true. Um, this is a typical case, but this, this should be uh, diagnosed with many procedures. And Professor Trail mentioned about MRI. And thin slice T2 weighted thin slice MRI is very important. For example, this size, uh, the trigeminal nerve is bended by the artery. And this is the nerve, which is compressed so strongly. And actually the slice is a little bit different for in terms of the artery. So uh, you, you don't see artery here, but this is so strongly bended. And this is also here is, and here you have a, a compression on the trigeminal nerve. However, oops, I missed, oh no, okay. However, in some article, they say up to 30%, even the patient doesn't have facial pain, there is a compression. Or if you take a look at the other side, that means uh, you have pain in this side and the other side you, have, you don't have pain, but still you have many vascular contacts to the nerve. So this, this is very important. For example, this is a 63 years old person and 
both left and right, you will see something. Here is something. And here also artery is compressing the... The 565 series needs your attention. And something I can hear, okay. Anyhow, and which do you think is the side of the pain? Right, left, actually this is left. So MRI is important, but MRI is not 100%. And this is the patient um, I treated oh, more than 10 years ago. At the time, our chart system was just a paper written, not the electrical chart system. So I'm sorry about my writing in Japanese. I just translate them into English. And uh, they have a 10 day tooth brush. Uh, they have a pain. And this is a trigger point. And this, even you don't touch it, you don't, if, if you touch it, you don't have pain, but you have pain on V1, V2, and V3. Okay, this is a typical sharp burning, electrical, very short. I thought this patient has a typical trigeminal neurology. However, when I take, I took the MRI, this is it. I expand it, here's the lesion. And I, I again asked her about her history. And this, of course, most of the trigeminal neuralgia suddenly happens, but this happened suddenly and Gradually, it is a little bit better. So initially it's worse and gradually it's better. So this is kind of vascular event. And actually it turned out to be, this is a spontane uh, infarction. And luckily or unluckily, our Japanese don't have multiple sclerosis so much, but this is multiple sclerosis cases in the literature and they have MS plaque here. And this is exactly the same place with our infarction patients. That means if you have a lesion here, the myelination or something, something wrong is here, you might have facial pain, very typical. So, uh, and in the multiple sclerosis, the prevalence of trigeminal neuralgia is about 10%. You have to be careful about that. If you are uh, in the Caucasian people, I mean, Indian people, maybe you have also a multiple sclerosis. And this is a typical meningioma. And if I take the tumors out and finally I found the trigeminal nerve, then the, tu the pain was gone. Of course, MRI is very important. This is a very interesting patient, 57 years old, human visit to my clinic with uh, very severe pain. And even um, too much pain, she complains always I have a pain and I'm all annoying and that kind of thing, she said. And one of my uh, colleagues says, oh, she's a, a little bit nerve uh, disease, not, a, I mean, a, I mean, psychiatric disease because, because uh, she complained too much. And even she visited two major hospitals in Tokyo and they say, you are too nervous. Your pain is not such much you feel too much. However, when they took MRI, it is like that. And that's it. But I think Professor Trell might re recognize here, the cistern size is different. And at that time, they didn't take the so-called diffusion weighted images. If you take diffusion Im weighted images, you realize that there's the epidermoid cyst, epidermoid tumor is important. So I take I took her to the OR and take the epidermoid out and here is a seventh nerve and here is a trigeminal nerve and her pain was totally gone. She is just a normal person. She doesn't look like a psych psychotic patient. She is just a usual patient. Because of so severe pain, her mental status was somewhat impaired. Okay, post-herpetic neuralgia is also important, but um, actually this patient didn't develop post-herpetic neuralgia, but if you have half as doctor, and if you treat nicely, you don't treat nicely, then later on, the patient might develop half as neurology. And if you didn't take a nice history, maybe you miss these things, and you might uh, fall into the drop that because of the false positive of the MRI that you open up with the skull and you didn't you move the artery away, but 
you didn't get a cure. So nice history taking is very, very important. This is also a very interesting question. Actually, it is already 10 years or something later when he came to my hospital, but he told me um, he got a, a, his car was hit from the back and he had a whiplash injury. And one day later, his gait was something long and two weeks uh, later, his facial sensory is some, somewhat disturbed. And after four months, he had the facial pain. And I took the neurology. And this is what I, after I asked him, I, I draw on his face that this is uh, uh, actually, this is the um, epistasia, this is parastasia. And if I touch here, it's, it's like a trigger zone. And then I looked at it, it's not totally different from so-called the trigeminal nerve one, second and third division, totally different. But I remember some other figure in the textbook. This is so-called onion skin-like uh, distribution. That means this region is not a branch, it's in the brain. So I took a nice MRI and found here a tiny, tiny infarction. It's the, really the locus of the uh, spinal tract or uh, nucleus. So uh, maybe there's a, some young neurosurgeon who is, uh, or maybe some young uh, uh, students, I don't know. Um, I'm just showing it here. So vertebrality, whiplash injury, maybe some damage and some vascular damage to the vertebrality and brainstem infarction will cause, would cause this and cause his facial pain. And although his facial pain doesn't, didn't become better, but because he knew what happened, his anxiety become, became better and his pain control became better. So to know the reason is also important, I think. Okay, um, this is a patient. She, she came to me and MRI shows something wrong is here and actually the size is here. And I gave her carbamazepine and it was effective and she go back to the local hospital and several years later, she came back with recurrent facial pain. And between these several years, she got a pacemaker implantation because of the cardiac problem. So I couldn't take any other MRI anymore. Um, when she sat on my on me, I realized that her eyes, tears, and a little bit red. That means, and I took a more detailed history. It's a it's a cluster headache. So her trigeminal neurological total control was carbamazepine, but her he she another, she had another headache, cluster headache, and sometimes trigeminal neurological and cluster headache combine in some patients. I realized. So this patient is also interesting. This is a man. He came to faraway district um, with a referral letter. I'm sorry, it's in Japanese, so I translated that into English. And um, one certain year, February, he had the right face numbness. And local hospital, a sensor problem, prestigia, prestigia, but one month later, numbness became pain. And they took MRI at the local hospital and they say there's a vascular compression on the trigeminal nerve. So this is the reason why your face has a pain. And they gave them carbamazepine, but the pain didn't go. More than that, he got a car accident because he was sleeping. And, and he took um, he examined the website and so on, and he asked his doctor, doctor if, I can visit, if I can visit uh, Dr. Fujimaki, and they, he came to me. And I took the neurology and I realized that um, there's some anesthetic lesion here, and hearing a little bit disturbed, and took the MRI, right side, expand, uh, and vessel, maybe, but because of the anesthetic 
I took the another, I took, I, I take a look at the, took a look at the another scans. And actually, you, some of you, you already might realize that there's a something here. This is kind of tumor. And this is not that one case. I have several cases like that. So I just sent him back to the local, not the local hospital, big hospital in the same region, uh, far away prefecture. And I directly called the uh, EMT surgeon that I have a patient. I think he has some cancer or tumor in the nose. So please to take a at him immediately. And they did surgery and the tumor inside the nose. I don't know what will happen later on, but uh, actually, if I did MVD, it's a disaster. Okay, also some patients came to me like a facial pain, but when I swallow, I also have a pain here. Oh no, no. it's not a trigeminal neuralgia. It's a, it's a gross pharyngeal neuralgia. I move the artery away from the gross pharyngeal nerve, a bigger nerve, and this pain was gone. And if I did surgery to the trigeminal nerve, it will be a disaster also. All right, so um, so let's go back to the trigeminal neurology. And in the in the um, up to date, they say, as Professor Trail said, pharmaceutical therapy first, and then surgery. We will con they will consider surgery if the patient is refractory to medical treatment. And medical treatment, it's not our job, but I will just mention carbamazepine, carbamazepine, gabapentin. Baclofen, I mean tryptine, these things help. So if you just gave them carbamazepine and didn't uh, satisfactory rate is half or sixty percent, then go to the um, other drugs at all. Please try it if you are a young doctor. Okay, and also JAMA, it says consult a neurosurgeon, maybe recommend it, and what Professor Trey will do, I don't know, but. I know now because um, he said very, very important things already. What we should do is do a proper diagnosis. This is a very important paper in general in neurosurgery outcome. And if the patient has atypical outcome, and no, I'm sorry, atypical facial pain, the failure rate is almost half. And even even typical trigeminal neuralgia, atypical, there is a, some mortality, of course, morbidity, but mortality. And cure rate is not 100%. I, I, I think uh, this uh, number is not so good, but uh, anyhow, there's a big difference. That means we should be very, very careful about taking the history, how the pain is going, and what the character is, how long, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera and, and also the history. Like neurology and MRI and other things, and then if needed, we will do surgery. Okay. The anatomy of trigeminal neuralgia surgery is here, and facial nerve is a little bit behind. So this is anatomy, and I will do the opening like that. Uh, sigmoid and transverse sinus angle. I made a so-called reverse T-shaped dural incision. And what I will do at the MVD is petrosal vein, and this is tentorial, this is the right side, this is a trigeminal nerve, seven and eight is around here, and this is a redundant super, super cerebral artery, is compressing the fifth nerve from the behind. I put the artery to the tentorial, tentorium, and then insert the tephron to mobilize the main uh, branch like that. This is a drawing, seven and eight is fifth, and covered with teflon, and I put them to, towards the tentorium. This is my concept. And to do so, horizontal fissure opening is very useful because then we will see the trigeminal nerve just in front of us between the pectoral vein. So I will show you just briefly some of my case. Just one case. Mm, okay. <coughs> Cutting arachnoid around the petrosal vein, and you will see the arteries compressing from the behind. 
And I already pulled the artery to the uh, centurion initially, and artery is dissecting away from the trigeminal nerve and inserting the teflon. And together with teflon, the artery is mobilized away. This is what I usually do, and seven Sundays here. But when I will do that, I sometimes care about the petrosal vein because it's this side of the fist now. I have to go through petrosal vein and deeper into the fist now. Maybe Professor Twell has, like Professor Twell has a nice hand. He will not scare about that petrosal vein, but I'm really scared about the petrol vein. Once you injure it, uh, once the blood is covered the whole field, I can do the night nice surgery, even I can control it. But uh, I, unfortunately, I didn't have such a big experience, but some doctors say they may, they may have bleeding 7%, uh, I, 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 a little bit higher percentage. But in that occasion, this is a paper from Pittsburgh, that they say, even you sacrifice the petrosal, super the petrosal vein, the uh, complication rate is not different from the, when you preserve and you, you cut. So of course you have to preserve, but once you have some breathing, cutting this vein is one choice, okay? And most important point, I already mentioned that the, the artery is pushed to the tentorium or to the uh, petrous bone, then moved away. But some doctors do like that, just inserting the material between them. The, I don't like that because I have several cases. This is my paper, old paper. When I experienced two of those cases, I wrote this paper. If they insert too much between nerve and vessel, it will cause another pain again. I don't like that. Um, Professor Janetta's paper, New England Journal of Medicine, it says 15 years, the excellent rate is 70% and et cetera, et cetera. It's not bad, but when we looked at his journal of neurosurgery paper, he's just inserting the teflon between. Maybe this is because, um, this is a Professor Sandu from uh, France, uh, his paper says non-compressive technique. If he did non-compressing, that means arteries moved away and no material between artery and nerve, then the cure rate is much higher than touching. And if we compare this at the 15 years, that the number is um, almost same with janitor and sando if touching and janitor, but not touching is far better here. So I think if first a janitor do not touching technique, maybe his result was better. So I prefer not touching technique. So I will show another of my case. So cutting horizontal fissure, alkaloid, And then you will see the trigeminal nerve. And actually here the artery compressing the nerve from the behind and cutting arachnoid around the petrosal vein. And seeing that supracerebral artery from the top and here is the uh, trucker nerve and pulling this toward the tentorium and open we will see the two of these branches. Just one is not enough. You have to carefully take a look at two branches. Often this, is, this happens. Cutting arachnoid and, move, and then pulls the artery towards the tentorium. Be cautious about the petrosal vein, which is 
um, near near side of the uh, uh, surgical field, and then inserting some teflon between the nerve and artery. But this time, this teflon is moved away together with the artery to the tenturium. Now here is the space, and totally moved away. This is my ideal surgery for the trigeminal neuralgia. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry I didn't touch about abrasive procedure, but as for the recurrence, um, I don't like the surgery for the recurrent trigeminal neuralgia, but um, sometimes the patient complains too much and I do. And I gradually, gradually remove those teflon or sponges between nerve and vessels and gradually move uh, them a little bit away and make a space between the compressing artery and nerve. And of course, sometimes maybe if it's not enough, we'll try um, the long axis cutting, not cutting, the touching of the trigeminal nerve. But, but sometimes I do that for the recurrent cases. Okay, uh, because of the time limitation, I will go to the hemifacial spasm. All right. This is what hemifacial spasm like. Then they move, they move together, and after strong movement and release, still the face twitches. This is a facial spasm, hemifacial spasm. And the facial diagnosis for that is, of course, many others. But um, for I will mention just two of them. And tick disorder, habitual tick, this is not, not uh, rare things. Sometimes even um, two months ago, my grandson did that. Uh, then he, he moved to another city and one week it's gone. Um, I lead myokemia, it happens to normal people. So these things are not a I think not a disease, uh, but Meij syndrome is very tough disease. Their eyes are closed, and so so much stress, and um, she moves not only both bilateral eyes, but all of the skin is here is also you might realize, and, and this is a so-called Meij syndrome, and. Mostly, we recommend them botulinum toxin injection. And most of the patients are treated periodically by the botulinum toxin injection. But uh, some, actually, some doctors say, mentioned about sensory trick, trick frames because those patients, if they touch one eye, their eyes become wider. If you, they touch here, their eyes become wider. So. Um, this bar is attached to the glass. This is Japanese made, but uh, I'm sure many come many in many countries they make like something like that. Even some doctor make a, 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 a scientific paper with this. Uh, this helps a little bit. And recently, after two, um, 2010, the paper is gradually gradually accumulating the evidence that. Deep brain stimulation might help Meiji syndrome because it is kind of dyskinesia. And this is a paper in 2011. They did GPI, gross pallidus internal stimulation, like that. And they had a nice result. And we are trying to find a patient, but most of the patients uh, diffuses it because of the major syndrome and opening brain. Oh, I, I don't like that. I just happy with the uh, bottom toxin. So, so far I did, we didn't do that. We only do Parkinson's and the essential tremor, but bilateral GPI is like that. And I think this is a good solution if the major syndrome is very, very strong. This is very, one of our, our very recent case. Okay, post paretic synkinesis. Sometimes also these patients are referred to me, or even they themselves come to me, okay? And the nerve is, this nerve is degenerated after uh, paresis, then the regeneration happens. But some nerve fibers, they have to go to eye, but they sometimes go to the, or, uh, mouth. And this 
nerve fiber can be regenerate. Some of them go there. So once the, the regeneration uh, completed, um, even the patient just tried to move eye, the, the mouse moves, try to move mouse, just move eye. But they think it's involuntary. But actually, this is a voluntary movement. So I tell them, try to control your face. And um, this is not a disease. You are already cured. Be brave. And uh, this is sometimes help, sometimes doesn't. Okay. All right. Go back to the hemifacial spasm. Hemifacial spasm is also caused by the vascular compression. And then, but if the patient doesn't like botulinum toxin, indicated, but I will go to the surgery. And I mentioned that trigeminal so neuralgia is here, but more caudally, we will do the surgery for the hemifacial spasm. And initially, we go this way, this way, this way, and found here. Okay, but some cases, it's very simple. Artery can be mobilized very easily. But in some cases, it is so complicated. And if we can know it beforehand, it is very helpful. But before going to that, we have to do nice craniotomy. This is not a patient, but if we are going to make a craniotomy to this patient, where did we make? What is important? Important things are uh, venous sinuses. Sigmoid sinuses are running here. And you cannot open dura in front of the sigmoid sinus. Of course, combined, combined petrosal approach is very different, but Usual, uh, usual suboxital craniotomy, you cannot go further. So the craniotomy is just behind the sigmoid sinus. But to make that, you need a nice landmark. And these sutures, asterions, a nice landmark, and also emissary veins, a good landmark. I like emissary veins. So if you find the emissary vein here, you take a look at the CD scan, and this is the emissary vein. So this is here. That means your sigmoid sinus is around here. So you make an opening here. Or you have a, or you have a uh, suture here. You have a suture here. OK. And if you open here, you just access to the sigmoid sinus several millimeters away. And you might realize that I made a nice, actually my, my fellow made a nice opening here, just behind the uh, uh, master's uh, air cells. Uh, but very close to sigmoid sinus, closer the better. But if you open here, you don't worry about that. But if you open here, you might open the master's air cells. Of course, you have to do that if you go to here. But master their cells, if they are open, what I will do is I just put small bone tips here and put wax, bone wax over there. That's it. And this is just following. <laughs> bone tips are not. But uh, master, um, bone waxes are always wax mastoid when you go in and out. This is often written in Peter Janetta's uh, papers or uh, textbooks. This is Peter, uh, 18, 1989. Okay. And when I, we need to open the mastoid cells, we make a new mastoid wall with using bone tips. And you may realize that there's no fluid inside here. That means we have nice, nice receding here and nice uh, exposure of the sinus. Excuse me, okay. that's the 565 yes. Pardon me? You may continue, Professor. Yeah. Yes, you may continue, Professor. Can, can, okay, yeah. So some, some lady uh, announced me in my ear. So, okay. Yes, I'll go ahead. All right. So, this case, um, here is the artery. Here is the artery. It's easy to see both in axial and coronary images. And actually, this artery is very simple. Here is a compressing artery. And I just, this is endoscope, this is microscope. And that just, I move by teflon, that's it. Very simple case. Um, again, relatively simple case. 
but this case, this are, uh, this are, um, uh, with axial images is uh, too much complicated. However, if you take a coronal images, I realize, we realize that the two arteries here, that's why it looks like a little bit complicated. And actually um, at surgery, uh, this is microscope, this is endoscope. We have a nice two artery compressing the facial nerve and we just move this away and it was okay. So compression at the root exit zone is best is too much, but uh, well visualized by heavy T2 direct coronal images. And we reported this in after neurochirurgia. And this year in the brain, very high impact journal, Pittsburgh group, lighter, uh, evaluated the compressing artery with coronal and axial image and et cetera, et cetera. It's a nice paper, but I don't know why our solo, they didn't cite our paper. I don't know why, you know. Okay. All right, let's go ahead to the, this patient. This patient, we had a artery here and here. And actually these arteries, um, the bending is different, but if I just move the cursor and I realize this, these arteries are the same artery, but it's a little bit away from the uh, real compressing, no, real root uh, zone. And you might realize here one more artery. Oops, oops, don't move. Oops, here, one more artery. So, so, um, um, actually, this is the endoscope and microscope. This is the, um, yeah, artery, and this is another artery. And actually, if you take a look at the, this is a surgical view. Here, you will realize that this artery is not compressing the facial nerve at all, and this is the culprit. I already inserted teflon here to mobilize a little bit. gradually, and you have to cautious about these tiny perforators. Then you insert teflon. And now the whole root exit zone is exposed. I, I put already two teflon tapes Okay, and this is my drawing. I two teflon tapes and also some more teflon um, on the brain stem, not on the facial nerve. The artery, uh, two, two arteries are together uh, moved away. Okay, this is another case. It is a little bit complicated. Here is the, actually this is the compressing artery and this is it. And it looks like encroaching. And this is a piker. And this is a pica, it's another angle. And this is surgery. Dissecting between ninth and focus is the key to see the root zone of the seventh nerve. Um, this is the, just the anatomy where and um, feet is feet. And if you take a look at the um, endoscope, soon you will see the real carpet on here. Oops, it doesn't, okay. This is the seventh focus and this is it. This is it. Okay, I will show you the expand, I'm sorry, expanded image like that. The artery is going into the brainstem and going out to the brainstem. This is seventh. Okay. Under the endoscope, I can do the surgery. So I will do the microscope surgery here. 
to confirm FITs, gradually uh, elevating the um, locus. Now you will see here, and I'm really worrying about you might have the, some branch to the brainstem. So gradually, 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 I'm elevating it. Even I put some surges between the artery and nerve to make sure there's no uh, perforating artery from the, uh, no, yes, tiny artery from this uh, carpet artery. And actually, there's nothing I can pull through away these, these sharp loop from the artery. So now I can do real decompression. I put some, no, I'm sorry, it doesn't move. Okay, yeah, now it's moving. All right, I put some teflon between the nerve and vessel. And with teflon tape, I will, I'm elevating them together away from the nerve and even put some teflon between brainstem and teflon to elevate these things away. Okay, here is the root exit zone, the seventh nerve. So this is the seventh. And this is the final view, Teflon 7th, Teflon 7th, drawings like that. All right. So um, this is a very important paper, 208. Professor Kaufman, his group wrote this one in general neurosurgery. Um, actually, if you take a look at the, just the shape, the, the nerve is coming out from here, but the nerve itself is, now far by itself running on the surface of the brainstem and go into the brainstem. This is the real learning of the facial nerve fibers. And they took a look at the, um, uh, the uh, cases. The compression is mostly here. And some are here, but even here is a compressing per point. And just you saw the, the vessel encroaching or the embedded into the brainstem. This is here and actually this point. So even this point will be the compression point. And if you have artery here and maybe here, if you just move this away and you ignore, you, uh, you didn't realize that, you will miss the real compressing artery. So very, very cautious about that. So this is another patient and actually, Axial and coronal, both of them are very, very difficult to see. And MRA, I thought this is the ICAR compressing together with vertebral artery for the facial nerve. But one of my young colleagues, Dr. Ujihara here, Ujihara here made these 3D images and ICAR is running like that. This is a facial nerve and there is the not big as I care, but uh, there's a piker here. And fat really compressing here is a piker. This is his diagnosis, uh, a little bit different from diagnosis. But because of this, I was very, very lucky. Okay, this patient has a large focus and large cerebral hemisphere compared to the other side. And the surgical field, 54 is in this patient, let me young large and pica and ICA and large focus and the visual and also vertebral artery, the visual field was very limited. So I just concentrated on the pica and exposed the pica dissecting here. And then pica was moved away, not touching ICAR, and the facial, facial spasm was gone. So with, with this 3D image help, I did a nice, MVD, even these complicated cases. So
So trigeminal neuralgia, I didn't do much. Maybe just one tenth of prostate cure, but um, uh, so far my cure rate is only 92% or something. And not adequately control patient at 5%, it's uh, so sad. But the fortunately, I didn't have any mortality, uh, mo big mobility, and six nerve palsy. But one month later, actually this patient was a taxi driver. Uh, battery artery, no, battery artery compression together with the six nerve, six nerve, fifth nerve together with battery artery, and I moved away. And the patient had a diplopia, and I'm sorry uh, he can't drive anymore. But one month later, it was cured, so I was lucky. Uh, facial spasm, I did uh, almost 1,000, but uh, the operation was excluded. Um, my initial surgery is 950 something. And cure rate is 93% and residual. But of course, you know that hemifacial spasm, sometimes it subsided in one, month, one year or something. So some of these patients might be subsided, but anyhow, some of them continued. So 16 patients, I did the operation and fortunately they have a, a successfully second operation, cured them. And the general operation, the general 55%. So I should do, I should be more and more nice um, because 100% it should be. But for, fortunately, uh, large, uh, no, no more mort mortality, but some uh, mobility. And one patient had the epidural hematoma of the posterior fossa and hydrocephalus. I need a ventricular drainage, but uh, cured without any sequelae. The real hemorrhage tiny and asymptomatic. I think this is, I didn't touch any vein, but this is venous congestion and hearing loss, 6% or something, I'm sorry for them. And not so, not so much other, other consequences. So I, I have to say that trigeminal neuralgia, as Professor Trail said, history taking nice neurology is very, very important. And my opinion, no processes between nerve and blood vessel. And petrosal vein is a scary thing. You have to be cautious. In patient spasm, the compressing point is really, really caudal. So you have to be cautious. And I do tape and ball technique. And I really thank to my, uh, my colleague, my, my team, and especially Professor Kobayashi is my right arm. And this is side armor. Tokyo, and I'm from Nagano Prefecture. I will just show you my, um, my countryside. It's like that. It's totally different from, uh, but I'm sorry, Himalaya, I know in India is nice mountain, but my, my, my mountain side is very nice. It's very close to the Winter Olympic game, Nagano Prefecture, it is there. And jump sites was around here, Hakuba village is just next to my hometown. So if you have a chance, just visit my hometown after the corona pandemic. And I'm ha happy to take any questions. Thank you. Professor Oops, I, I have to ask uh, escape. Um, I, I did Please, something Everything wrong. is fine. Uh, Professor Turel, you may kindly say your Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Yes, yes, thank you. Dr. Fujimaki, that was a very elaborate coverage of a very uh, uh, vast subject of uh, uh, pain and facial involuntary movements, both together. Uh, there is only one question in the chat box, which uh, asks about the views on radiofrequency thermocoagulation treatment for trigeminal neuralgia. And um, yeah. what are your views on it? So you... Yes. You have not mentioned about the other methods of treatment, so perhaps yes, right. you can use this question to start the uh, discussion. Okay, uh, actually, some coagulation um, in Japan, most neurosurgeons don't do that. Only I think only um, Professor Hori do that, <laughs> and mostly they are done by the uh, pain clinicians, and it's kind of separate clinical settings, and some of them come to me after thermocoagulation because they don't like numbness. But 
the, the pain clinicians, anesthetologists didn't tell them much about the numbness. They just do some coagulation and they say, oh, okay, your pain is gone. But the, the patient says, my pain is gone, but how about my numbness? What will you do? And they don't like that and they come to me. But if the patient is happy with numbness and if they are happy with the uh, pain control, they won't come to me. So it's up to the patient. But I have just one case very recently. The patient came to me because she had a nice uh, anesthetologist. And she already received 20 times of something, some coagulation, okay? And it's almost anesthetic. But unfortunately, the anesthetologist died. She visited another anesthetologist, but that anesthetologist cannot well control her pain. And now she has a severe pain. And I take a look at the MRI, and the trigeminal nerve is totally atrophic almost nothing, like a thing. So I don't think if I do any MVD, this patient won't get a nice, nice um, uh, resolution of the pain. So I just get trying to give her a nice uh, you know, combination of some drugs and now her pain control is better with two of carbamazepine and some other drug, drugs. So I don't like to do any more thing, just medication. But some patients are happy with some equation, some are not. That is my answer. Is that enough? Yeah. So if if we have time, I can ask a couple of questions. Sure. Dr. Fujimaki. You said you would prefer uh, not touching the trigeminal nerve. Yes. Uh, when you're operating and only mobilizing. I, I mean, prosthesis. Process, yeah. You yes, use no. prosthesis mm. to touch the nerve. Mm -hmm. or use processes to mobilize the vessel. Right, right. There are, there are times when we have found, uh, uh, well, I have not really had this occasion of um, in more than mm -hmm. one patient in my a series of 1,000 and odd patients that I have operated, mm -hmm. only one time, only one occasion, I did not find mm -hmm. a neurovascular conflict. And probably this was in my very early years when, uh, when uh, MRI mm -hmm. was not so well developed. Uh, yes. But the point remains, uh, what mm. do you do if you do not find a neurovascular conflict? Mm. What would be uh, your... Okay. Yeah, actually, um, I, in my tiny experiment, experiences, I, I ha always ha found something. But some patients, the pain is... Um, I'm, I'm sorry. The, the compression is not so typical, not so strong. Of course, I move them away. In these cases, I do so-called combing. <clears throat> Just, this is a nerve, this is a nerve. <clears throat> I put very, very tiny, uh, for, not a fossil, uh, na, na, mm, like a 12 uh, lotons uh, forceps uh, bar and into the <clears throat> nerve and like that. Uh, with the same axis, uh, combing, so-called combing technique, mm. I did several in several cases, and they don't have any numbness or stasis, but they have a nice pain control. And but be careful, <laughs> of course you know that. But be careful. Thing I do that some patient has bradycardia. Mm. If you touch too much to the trigeminal nerve, but that's transient. Only when you are doing it. Bradycardia does not remain. Yes, no, of course, yes, yes. If I draw the instrument, it, it comes back. But some, some patients, their cardiac pace stopped for 10 seconds. 10 seconds. It's scary, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I would say those people who have not found the vessel compression, I asked many times, I'm asked this question. I said, you look for veins. Many people do not talk much about yes, veins. Yes. Many talks about arteries. But veins yes. are also very commonly incriminated with trigeminal neuralgia, yes. sometimes in combination with the artery and sometimes right, entirely, right. entirely solo, only vein compression. Yes. yes, It has been largely unreported by many people. Yes. So this is a mm. time to remind people that you could also have veins as the cause of neurovascular mm -hmm. conflict. Uh, although they don't appear to be pulsating like the artery, mm -hmm. but 
We are not appearing per sitting because I feel we have opened the systems mm -hmm. and the CSF pressure is low. But in a close... Uh, uh, okay, yes, yes. In a close uh, environment, when the CSF mm -hmm. and everything is formed, the mm -hmm. veins are pulsating mm -hmm. also. And you can see venous pulsation yeah, okay. in, uh, of thermoscopy. Mm -hmm. In fundoscopy, mm -hmm. you do see veins pulsating, yes. don't yes. you? So veins mm -hmm. are pulsating. It's just that when you mm -hmm. open the subarachnoid space, mm -hmm. and turns, you don't see them pulsating. Mm -hmm. So the pulsations of veins, they may not be as strong as the artery. Right. They, <laughs> okay. do, they do pulsate. Yeah. I skin. agree with you. Yes. If I found the vein and the artery, artery moved away, and also vein, I coagulate. And if it's too big, I'm scared about the cut. But if it's not so big, I just coagulate and cut. Yes. Those veins which are passing through the rootlets, is uh, quite mm. often. Uh, ah, okay, yes. And and those veins you can easily coagulate and cut and and section it. Yes, yes. They are not. Uh, yes. They are, the patient will not have any deficit with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, then talking about veins, the important problem is about the petrosal vein, and this has been discussed yes. many times in many uh, my, many of my complications meetings also. Do we yes. Yes. do yes. we sacrifice or do we not sacrifice? Do we make an effort to preserve? And my mm. excuse me, Epson L five hundred and sixty. Your your opinion is, Doctor Tro. I cannot hear you. Can you unmute your mic, please? You should try and preserve the veins as mm. often as possible, and do not sacrifice it mm. uh, randomly. Mm. Make every effort. Mm. It is sometimes very tiring and and uh, very delicate mm. to try to preserve yes. because, yes. because it. Yes. Sometimes the posterior fossa is too small. Sometimes the space yeah, right. the is too narrow. The angle mm -hmm. is too less. And sometimes mm -hmm. the, the supramedial cubicle, mm -hmm. the pitch yes. is bulging. Yes, I, I also didn't mention that, but uh, sometimes I do read that. Yeah, so you have to drill that and you have to see that mm -hmm. you can get to the bottom mm -hmm. of it and, sacri and avoid sacrificing mm -hmm. pitrosal vein mm -hmm. at all cost. Yeah. I have yeah. seen Peter Zanetta operating of, on MBD patients. But he does not. He did not believe uh, that it was so important to preserve, and he was quite uh, mm -hmm. well, casual about preservation of petrosal vein. But I don't think that's a. You mean Peter? Sorry. Peter Janeta. Yeah, I have seen him operate in. Uh, when yeah, I was... yeah, yeah. Because uh, because in his paper he he said he coagulated. Yeah, exactly. So this is something uh, that if the master of uh, uh, MBD talks like that. <coughs> I think the message yeah. is uh, maybe maybe he got away with it. Maybe he was lucky, but that is not the message I would like to give to the people today. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Right. I think we can wind this up now. Yeah. We had a very wonderful lecture today. I would like to sincerely thank Professor Fujimaki and Professor Keki Turel for this wonderful presentation. May I kindly also inform that uh, this meeting is being broadcasted in WeChat in China, thanks to Professor Shubin. And today we have 1,000 people who are watching us live on different streaming oh, platforms. Right? Yes, on Zoom, YouTube, and WeChat. So with that, wow. we can go on to our next chair. Professor Anil Karapurkar is waiting to hear the lecture from Professor, Professor Hiroeki Toyama. We'll hear from Professor Karapur, sir. Thank you, the CNS, for asking me to chair this session. And this is virtually about training. And before I go on, I join uh, Keki Turel in congratulating uh, Professor Yoko Kato. She has been a great support to our neurosurgical fraternity in India. And she has given us unstinted uh, help every time that we have asked for her. In fact, I think she has attended more the several vascular sessions in India, then uh, certainly I have. I don't know about how many Keki has attended, but I think she has attended many more. She and uh, uh, Kano, when he was there, and uh, Sano together have probably attended many more and taught us so much about uh, neurosurgery, vascular neurosurgery, I should say. So, uh, well deserved award to Professor Yoko Kato. And uh, about the topic for today, uh, training the, the elements of endovascular operations. I think training is a very important part of uh, neurovascular intervention. And 
I have had people coming and saying, oh, we want to come for two months, I want to come for three months, I want to come for six months. But that is not enough. You know, in neuro intervention, complications are so common. It is so easy to get a complication. Even with a diagnostic angiogram, patient has come perfectly normal, walked in and you do an angiogram and the patient goes out with a homonymous field defect or with a, with a hemiparesis. This is un unacceptable today. And it is very easy to get a complication. You can very easily cause a dissection of an artery. You can very easily inject a compass, a clot, a piece of gauze, cotton. You find you will find all kinds of things being injected into arteries. So training is very important. And I always tell all my fellows, there is no such thing as routine in, neurosur in neurosurgery or in endovascular surgery for that matter. Because even the most simplest of procedures can be a nightmare. So please do not take training as a lightly. You should take proper precautions and take the food. Luckily in India now, through the National Board of Examinations, we have a full two-year, full-fledged, full-time two-year training course in neurovascular interventions. There is an entrance exam, then there is a two-year didactic training program, and then there is an exit exam. I think we are one of the first countries to have this. Japan, of course, has always had a very formal training program for decades now. And I think they were at the forefront of stressing the importance of training. So with these few words, I welcome uh, Professor uh, Toyoma and ask him to deliver his talk on uh, uh, elements of neurovascular intervention. Professor Toyoma, please. Thank you and best retreat, I'm from Kansas City, Chicago, Japan. Our hostel is a memorial neurosurgical clinic started in 2005. Boron AT is one of the aortic variations. As you can see, less common carotid artery goes up from bronchiocephalic artery. It means said that there are nearly 10 percent or less. It was an acute angle from descending artery. That's why it's difficult to approach and get a candidate. Therefore, it is reported that her neurological complication more than the other types of neurocardiac starting. Depend on the case, I think it is useful road, transbrachial or lateral artery. But it is able to have possibility to pass easily. And if we want to be more stable and the guiding cutting. I will explain about the essential guiding cardiac system. Recently, there are a lot of kind of devices. So I will introduce a typical image of the system and that's all. This one is the image of a basic guiding cardiac system commonly used. First, you have to know the position between each other devices. Also, I think, it's a useful way to make your familiar system. Then you can compare with the other devices when you choose the other ones. And there are some kind of pre shaped in the cardiac. As you can see on the slide, uh, the represent, present of the one Headhunters, Simon, JB2, and so on. I usually use one called about countdown in a cattle on um, using over a French guiding cattle. It was good operability because it is made big as hand. Normally the size of five to nine French guiding cattle are used during the vascular treatment, including barrel guiding. It's necessary to Keep more stable guiding cardiac before approaching the region for achievement more excellent treatment. And take position of guiding cardiac 
way where you can send your monitor. Collaboration field tend to be more crowded so organized than the member of this process. For example, situation by collaboration we spent for several and reasons. It must be really confused. As you can see in the slide, it is who use at least four white connections, three to every west of Cox, and two or three irrigation systems with pressurized back on the calling with them. We'll explain about the basic theory of new and vascular treatment techniques. I think that the result of determined factors are divided into three classes, namely patient factor, device factor, and operator factor. On patient factors, depend on the patient, it might be difficult to perform the vascular treatment. For instance, patients who have any basic disease or age uh, tend to have atherosclerosis or um, severe. Also, it is difficult to, uh, to be hard and measuring vessels. In particular, types of or bovine iota are not easy to pass a catheter I shot before. As you can see on the slide, this schema. Types will have higher angles, so it has caps as many as the other ones. Also, cutter is going to be snakes, so cutter to this and they're not going to be now. On the like the type of situation, if you add too much strength to go ahead, possibly the cutter will snap to the sending altar because the cathedral is going to be straight, but the other is going to be keeping. This principle is long up action and direction on the cathedral operation. This knockdown situation is able to make the kinking of its cathedrals who are sliding down their treatment devices. So you, you must be conscious of this theory during a cardiac operation. This cardiac theory is the same as intracranial artery. It will only be small. As you can see, we occupy the right of this situation. That is, for example, the A1 case which has a high angle shape from IC. Microcardiac is fed up to M1 with making rope when it is added the strength to go ahead possibly. Naturally, patient other condition cannot change, but you are able to perform more easily if you use their devices by contrivance. There are many factors on the budget. For example, cathedral shape, distance, thickness, hardness, friction and so on. Also, you can combine with each other factor to perform more easily. Needless to say, the, the most important factor an operator needs to have skills, knowledge, experience, good relationship with staff, and heart and gut. In my opinion, but the basic theory of the vascular surgery. First, you have to collect the patient's information before operation as much as possible. Next, get enough knowledge of the essential anatomy, characteristic that the device is, and compatible specification during each device. Finally, make planning in detail before operation and consider thinking about what do you use and combine their devices uh, when kind of each case is? About the technical steps using a vascular simulator. First of all, you should use the scene as long as possible. 
because it is making the first bit of the and vascular treatment and is able to perform the guiding candidate. Well, the doctor guy why uh, he waited his breath to the different vessel for the moving the table. When guy why allowed the descending out, keep the guy why uh, next for this the in the cadet and the guiding cadet. Select the target either you need in a cadet with guide wire where you want to go. If you cannot to keep the inner cadet, make a contrast image with injection from proximal and make road mapping when necessary. It's difficult to approach so what to bigger size of guiding cadet because they have higher strength to be straight. Therefore, you should follow the guiding cadet with a going for surgery. The cadet is going to go ahead through the bent artery over the basal wall. When the blood vessel is straight, cadet will go up straight, but blood vessel bending cadet is going to be curved on this point. Cut the cord or head through the cow to the starting point. Because so, when there is an escape in the point of the cow, it falls easily. Therefore, but I have to control that part with the blood vessel, which is going to maintain a cutter and shape that are going to improve. When the cutter doesn't go up with the cutter to for the wire and pull the cutter once, you can get the become straight the cutter to either. When well, like uh, the situation, it is easy to go ahead, try to add and rotate the guiding cutter. To metal vessels, blood action, reaction, friction, resistance, balance between other and the cutter and so on. Solution method. When you cannot approach easily, you should try to change a different type of the cutter to what their shape, hardness, or their friction. And the first thing in the cutter doesn't fall. Also, when a guiding cutter doesn't fall, change the guide wire to stiff type because vessel is going to be straight and the next cutter will follow easily. Add the strength to go ahead with many force forces, usually directing the anti-clockwise rotation or push and pull depend on your feeling. Ask your assistant to keep the guide wire I think the surgeon who can employ an assistant well has many excellent doctors. It is one of the ways to change the different world to trans brachial or trans lateral artery. There are some application methods so you can try them when you never get the target vessel. But you should perform an invest surgery more simply. Next, I will do my real vascular treatment same broadly. I'm glad if you get the guidance of treatment loosely. This is the rest card standing case. All the problems are the stop.
of the repairing the devices I could repair my hand loading. The pen says, I cut it, I cut it, and guide wire with irrigation system. I offer you this stopping valve when I expect that difficult to pass. I always prepare a defrater and or vibrate irrigation balloon and cut it to according planning before I made because to be shown the operation. We usually perform an endovascular surgery on local anesthesia. Actually, in the femoral artery when on the level of the head of the femoral bone. We found the book floor inside the guide wire. The replace and uh, the set. I told people you should use the set as long as possible because it will make the vessel treatment. Then, hyperinization until twice time at ACT. What is the guy wire? on the ascending outer and for the next inner end guide and cut it. Select the common cutted artery within the catheter and for the guide and catheter. Next, put a digital protection device on this catheter to use the easy filter. And then, found the retardation balloon. Before the retardation, differently injected Purple brain for the bloody card preservation. Next, press and open the stand. It was in the easy filter stand. Because it, it was expected as unstable plug. So finally, Perform the post dilatation. The count in ten seven. Then correct the filter using caption. Make image before get off the filter. If there is a no more low flow on that. We always use the scale to get stopping the breathing. Make image before using the angle scale if it has clarification or not. But I think angle scale doesn't guarantee hemostasis because I have experienced hematoma over 10% after operation.
Now I'm researching the reason why it couldn't, couldn't make a mustache completely. It makes like a sandwich to use the crack and sponge and but it's easy to break. Next, this is the 41 years old woman left in tunnel carded and only six kilometer base tank. It was found on the physical examination. On the chest was performed on local and stadium. First, instead of shaved after that, injected the heparin by it to become was time at the SCT. Put on the side of the seven French guy in cardio, using four French in a cardio to coordinate the other as deep as possible. And made the radiation system using double wire connection. Next, maybe made to make the road mapping. And it was Pressing the microcardial into the artery to do the calling. After that, uh, microcardial was pressed on the distal ICA for putting the stent. The case was used to uh, ascertain the microcardial. And to other prepare it. You can say it confirmed to remove from standing say if they are in the year or not from at the end of the white connection. After press man the stand calling calling was started. This case was near the neuroform ultra stand because it is very flexible in the artery. We already use the new form atlas on the case of the ICA. Call packing position doing as you can see on the video. It is always very crowded on the calling with stand on the operation ferret because it is using four collection and three triple cock stop with irrigation systems. So organize the, and the memorize the press of the devices to avoid the dispressing. We always perform the vascular surgery with two surgeons for hand. It is important that the making combination. This second doctor, a tank Tankeuchi, is very, very excellent surgeon. I worked with him for 15 years so long. So we can make the best combination naturally for them and the best treatment. And this is the final bill on this call emergency way stand. It was good cause. Finally, I will start in the people flag. I presented the master treatment theory and I thought this presentation was for young your who wanted to 
want to be the UN vascular specialist. Question, uh, let's acquire experience. They are left to do the experience that had that one the ground recently because the other is taking the dropping is now. So I think it fast. Do more the cutter on your broken when you suspect that the brain is dead because the advice right man very much for your thanks Professor Kara Professor. Kindly unmute your mic, Professor. We can ask. Thank you, Professor Koyama. You gave a nice talk on the basics. The sound was not very good, but I think most of us have understood what you are trying to say. And uh, you have covered the basics very well. Uh, are there any questions? Let me just check on the chat box. Not, not yet. There are no questions. There are no questions. <laughs> okay. And maybe I can uh, add a few comments. Sure, why not? Uh, so, as you showed, simulation. Today, there are simulators where you can not only simulate how to do a diagnostic angiogram, but for everything, how to do a carotid angiography, how to do carotid angioplasty. Not only do you learn how to do it, but you get a report at the end where you know what mistakes you have made and how you can improve. So there are modules where you have uh, carotid angioplasty, where you have uh, boiling of aneurysm, uh, stenting, and today acute stroke. Because today I think a large part of our practice uh, in India certainly is uh, thrombectomy for acute stroke. And uh, as you have pointed out, having a small catheter inside a big catheter is always very helpful and when you get stuck, you do a torquing maneuver and you can get the catheter to go past. Yeah. So I think in neuro intervention, what is most important is you have to learn to be very gentle. Don't push. If your catheter is not going, as he showed, that angle forms. So don't yeah. allow that angle to form. Don't push. If you keep on pushing, there'll be a dissection of the artery. Yeah. So I think that is a very important point that you had made there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a very important point and uh, 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 deciding the cardiac type and the uh, handle technique in the, the, the uh, case. And so the uh, very important uh, to know the uh, type of the outer or the vessel uh, before the surgeon, surgery and, uh, and before treatment. I, uh, uh, I think it's a very important point. Yes, absolutely. So yes. it is very important to study the arch on the MRA. We yes. always make it a point to study the arch. Yes. If for some reason we do not have the MRA showing the arch, we do an yes. arch angiogram first. So we use yes. a pigtail catheter, do an angiogram, and then proceed. So yes. especially if it is a type 3 arch, it can be very difficult unless you know where the origins of the arteries are. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, if I uh, use the, the, the MRA, the, the uh, patient and the, the patient doesn't and the, use the, the medicine, right? and the, uh, uh, easy to the inspection, they do the inspection and the, for patient, right? the good for the patient, I think. Yes, and, uh, but it depends on the case and the, uh, uh, if the patient has the, the very uh, hard and the calcification, uh, then the MRV cannot and the image and the calcification uh, and the food. And I think and the, the, uh, we need to collect the, the information the more and more and the MRI and the echo and the, 3D CT scan and before the uh, before the uh, DSA, you see, and and the, if uh, the only the inspection, then uh, we can uh, use the block uh, trans trans bracket or the radial 
it's easy to yeah. easy to uh, take the take the, uh, the medical course for patients. I think it's like you showed for the bovine arch, the radial is a good route to take. Yes. Yeah, yeah, very useful and uh, useful way to the, the perform the uh, depend on the uh, arch out the arch. Um, I saw the I prepared the the plan and uh, for the patient uh, when uh, I think uh, the, to do the the uh, cut it to performing uh, in yes. the bovine out there. And uh, so the, I use uh, always and uh, prepare and uh, explain and for the patient and uh, uh, if I uh, uh, don't uh, don't uh, don't pass and uh, only femoral artery, I will do the uh, trans radial or the trans uh, brachial. I always uh, explain it for the patient. Well, recently we had a basilar artery aneurysm and we could not go from uh, the arch because the catheter kept doing what we just said. It kept mm. buckling. So finally we had to go from the radial. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so sometimes, yes. Uh, yeah. So you have to be familiar of today how to go from the radial also. That is not very common. And sometimes, rarely, you may also have to puncture in the neck, direct puncture. Yeah, that, is, uh, that is that is rarely now, but occasionally you may have to do a direct puncture in the neck also. And but I think and uh, direct puncture is very dangerous. <laughs> so I uh, I uh, I didn't uh, research. Yeah. Mm. When I when I trained in 19, in the 70s, we had to do all angiography. There was no CT, there was no MRI, so we had to do carotid sticks. And uh, yeah, it's not difficult. Uh, if you if you use ultrasound, it is even better because with ultrasound it becomes very easy. Ultrasound. So you can use ultrasound in one hand and the puncture needle in the other hand, and you can make sure that you're in the center of the artery and puncture. Ultrasound. So especially when you are doing with the carotid or even for the radi radial sometimes the mm -hmm. ultrasound guided puncture might be easier. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah sometimes and uh, it's useful yeah. to use, uh, the puncture, the direct puncture. Yeah. Yeah. Right, thank you very much. I think we can wind the session for today. Uh, Professor Tarapurkar, any concluding remarks from your side? No, I would say, reiterate again what I said. Training is very important. Anybody who wants to start neuro intervention has to first train adequately. Start with femoral puncture, start with diagnostic angiogram, start with simple procedures, and then go to more complex procedures like uh, intravascular devices, intra aneurysmal devices, and all that. So, progressively learn simple things and go to difficult, complex things. Thank you very much. Professor Raja, and thank you very much, Professor uh, Toyama, for your uh, Toyama for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Right, thank you, thank you very much. We had a very great learning session. With that, I would like to wind this up officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Kaito. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Fujimaki and Professor Toyama Hiroki, as well as the chairs, Professor Keiki Churin and Professor Anil Karapurkar for taking out the time and supporting our webinars. Regarding then, uh, I would like to especially thank Professor Shubin, who is our main mentor from China and who has arranged a WeChat broadcast for today. And nearly we have more than 1,000 audiences who have joined us live today. Thanks to my co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Singh, for joining in. So until we all meet on the 28th of August, it is bye-bye from everybody. Thank you very much for joining me. <laughs>